what are you doing? And he turns to you and says, what do you think I'm doing, stupid? I'm laying bricks. You then ask the other guy, what is it you're doing here? And he says, I'm building a pillar. What does it look like? But then you ask the third guy, what is it you're doing? He turns to you and he says, I'm building a church building for the glory of God. Which one of those builders is going to work harder? Which one of those builders is going to work with everything they have? It's the third one. Because he's got the big picture. He's got the big vision. And these types of conferences are so helpful because they enable us to take a step back and see the big picture. And it's most likely that the Holy Spirit has put his finger on one or two things for you over this last 22 hours. I want to remind us how God did that for Nehemiah. Nehemiah obviously saw a problem. What was the problem he saw? Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Here's a freebie for you. If anyone comes to you with a problem, ever that happen in church life as church leaders? Oh yeah. You can turn to them and say, you know what? Maybe God's giving you a Nehemiah call. (laughs) Turn the problem back onto them. There's a problem. Jerusalem lies in ruins. This is Nehemiah trying to rally the troops, trying to gather the people to build with him the vision that God has given him. What does he do? He presents a problem. What problem has the Holy Spirit highlighted to you? Maybe the first session, the word of God has not been spoken enough to our young people. Maybe the second session, we're not doing enough to reach the poor. Maybe something about today has been highlighted for you. What's the problem? Remember, Nehemiah then moves on though. He doesn't just leave it at a problem. He brings a solution. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. What's the solution to the problem that the Holy Spirit has put upon your heart? What's he calling you to go back to your place, back to your location to do? And thirdly and finally, he brings a why. There are many problems in our churches, many problems in our world, and there are solutions that we can think of But the important question for us to ask is why? What does Nehemiah say? We will no longer be in disgrace. Okay, there'll there'll be a solution, there'll be an outcome for this. But also I told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. This is where it's so helpful that the king of kings lives in you and I and he tells us what to do when. There are many problems in the world, many problems in the church, and there are many solutions that we could come up with But what's the gracious hand of your God done on you in this last 22 hours? What has he said? I want you to just work on this one for now. There are many problems, but this one for now. Remember that the walls of Jerusalem had laid, uh, fallen down and destroyed for 150 years. But there came a time when God was saying, no, now's the time for the walls to be rebuilt. The temple's been rebuilt. There's been a spiritual renewal. Now we need the walls being rebuilt. What's the Holy Spirit saying for you for now in your location? There was uh, a story of some boy scouts and one of the scouts fell from a tree and the scouts, the young lads, came running to their scoutmaster saying, Jimmy's fallen from the tree. Jimmy's fallen from the tree. And the scoutmaster did something really interesting. He didn't run. He walked towards the problem. The children are trying to emphasize the danger. They think this young Jimmy might be dead. What are you doing? Scoutmaster, he walks with purpose, but he walks. He was asked later, why did you walk rather than run? He said there were two reasons. The first is I knew upon arrival at the scene it was going to be serious. And I knew my first decision had to be the right one. And so walking allowed me that time to think and process what I was going to do. 
And he said, secondly, I thought, actually, if this young lad has stopped breathing, I need to be in a position and place to be able to give him breath-to-breath resuscitation. If I ran, I would not be in a position to be able to do that. Often when we have have a problem put upon our hearts by the Holy Spirit, we see the solution, we see the why. If you're anything like me, you're a leader, you're a bit of a horse rather than a donkey. A donkey needs to kind of kick up the bum to get going. A horse needs reining back a bit. Often as leaders, we just want to rush right in for the solution. But what does Nehemiah do? When he first hears of the problem, he prays for four months. And then when he eventually goes with the favor and blessing of God to rally the troops, what does he do? He walks around the walls and investigates. He walks before he talks, if you like. He walks around before saying what he's going to do. Let's not rush in to fixing the, solu- the problems that we've been made aware of these last 22 hours. Let's do some further prayer, do some further reading, do some further reflection, do some further talking, so that when we come to bring the solution, to rally the troops, we can speak with clarity, authority, and understanding. I really love the film A Braveheart, if anyone loves that film. And uh, one of my favorite moments in the film is when uh, Mel Gibson is with all his troops and the English are running towards the Scots, Mel Gibson and his army. And he tells his army to hold. You remember the bit in the film? There's this huge army running towards Mel and all these Scottish warriors. And you can tell they're a little bit afraid, a little bit timid. This army is coming right towards them. And Mel says, hold. (laughs) And these soldiers are already there waiting. And then he says, no. And all these Scots, (laughs) the Scots will be happy, (laughs) raise up these pikes. And the English horses run right onto the spikes of the Scottish. They'd left it to that, just that critical moment so that when these spikes came up, the horses were pierced and they won the battle. There is a time to hold, hold, but there's a time to go and release as well. For those who perhaps are more like a donkey, (laughs) there's a time to make some action, exactly what Claude was saying. Nehemiah took action. He left the palace, tasting the best wine and food the world had to offer. He took some sacrificial action and left the palace. He then persevered under opposition. Nehemiah chapter 6, just full of different types of opposition he encountered. Opposition is normally a sign of God's will on your life, not the opposite. It confirms the call if it's tough. And then he completed the work. Nehemiah chapter 6 verse 15 He finishes the work. The wall is restored two and a half miles long, 40 feet tall, 20 feet thick. It's estimated 1.5 billion tons of material has now been renewed. I mean, we get staggered, don't we, by the Chinese rebuilding a hospital in 10 days, but they had machines to do that. In just 52 days, this wall was reinstated, left for 150 years, and in 52 days, reinstated. No wonder Nehemiah 6 verse 16, they realized that this work had been done with the help of God. We're not going back to our places alone. (laughs) We're going back with the help of God when we're doing what he's asked us to do, what he's put the finger upon, when we've waited But then when we've gone and taken sacrificial action, we can see amazing things happen. Amazing things happen. I'm going to ask uh, David and James to come back and we're going to have a time, uh, just the last 10 minutes, to worship and to pray for one another.
But really, Nehemiah is not about Nehemiah, is it? We know that. Claude helpfully showed us that the Bible is not about us. It's about Jesus. Who else was at the right hand of the king? Like Nehemiah was at the right hand of the king, Jesus. And when Nehemiah left the comfort of the palace, Jesus left the comfort of heaven to come to earth. And where Nehemiah's vision for the walls caused him to weep over Jerusalem, Jesus' vision for the world caused him to weep over Jerusalem. And where Nehemiah actively waited for God's timing to outwork his vision, so Jesus set his face like flint under the Father's timing. And when Nehemiah had a plot on his life to kill him, Jesus was actually killed. And where the people of God in Jerusalem were trapped in shame and danger, but now safe and dignified, so too we were caught in the shame of our sin and the danger of the wrath of God, but now we're safe and dignified and restored because of what Jesus has done. And when Nehemiah then, I don't know if you've ever seen this in the book, he actually hands over the responsibility of securing what he'd achieved to his brother. And so now our older brother Jesus, he's died, risen and ascended. He's now commissioned us, his younger brother, to continue the work he started and see his kingdom grow. We have a mission to fulfill because of what Jesus has done. He's brought us in and involved us in establishing his kingdom.